A corpse is like daily soup. The longer it lies there and deteriorates, the better it becomes. You can't comprehend it just like that. You have to taste it, Mikhail Novoselov said during questioning. Have you ever had intercourse with a six-year-old girl who had been lying dead in the sun for two or three hours? Novoselov asked the investigator bluntly and casually. The question left the investigator surprised and speechless. As befitting a maniac of his caliber, M. Novoselov was accidentally apprehended, for no apparent reason. In Dushanbe's Central Park, he attempted to steal an air rifle from a shooting range and was caught red-handed at the scene. The thief was taken to a pre-trial detention center and a routine criminal case was being prepared. Then, unexpectedly, a call came in from fellow operatives in a neighboring district. Do you have Novoselov? Keep an eye on him. We're sending a team. What have you done? Detention center staff asked Novoselov. I borrowed a couple of sacks of Uruk from my neighbors, he replied nonchalantly. A few days later, it was revealed that Novoselov was responsible for three murders with rape in Tajikistan. Almost immediately, more on the reasons for his unprecedented candor later, the detainee confessed to three additional murders in Tajikistan and 16 in Russia. The investigative team, with the assistance of experts, began exhuming the remains of children at the burial sites indicated by Novoselov. The geographical scope of Novoselov's crimes extended from Udmurtia to Siberia. I'm a traveler by nature, he remarked during another interrogation. He was a remarkably talkative maniac. The world has turned bitter. Everyone has become callous, cruel, like animals. They'll kill over a ruble. Is that normal? Why did I kill? It wasn't out of malice. I desired a sexual life. What am I supposed to do if I'm only skilled with dead bodies? He questioned. Indeed, he would consistently return to the scene of the crime two or three hours later. You're a necrophiliac, they accused him. Uh, no, I'm a rebel, he retorted, and began reciting Omar Khayyam, quoting quatrains about rebels. He had three names, three passports, and three lives. He assumed the identities of Novoselov, Svetlov, and Shakhraziev as the situation warranted. His documents were scrutinized multiple times. Everything appeared legitimate. He would be Russian when required, and when needed, he would adopt a distinctive accent. A professional photographer, artist, painter, and geologist, he possessed credentials for all these fields, which helped him greatly when making acquaintances. Young lady, your facial features are incredibly expressive. Have you ever done a magazine shoot? A brief stroll and a casual chat? And then an iron clamp around the neck as a final act. Novoselov committed his first crime at the age of 17. He had an argument with two men, pulled out a knife, and cut them, though not fatally. He sat down, walked away. It didn't even leave a lasting memory, who wouldn't? The turning point, or stroke of fate as he philosophically called it, came later, after his initial imprisonment sometime in the 80s. After saving up money and mustering the courage, Novoselov decided to engage the services of a prostitute. He chose a more attractive one for an entire night. However, she left him within 20 minutes, laughing and advising him to buy a small jack. The sound of her laughter in that word, not even jack, but jeleska, a diminutive term for jack, still echoed in his ears. They might have been the catalyst. Sometime later, while in the town of Tchaikovsky, Perm region, he killed a girl near a restaurant. Yet, he didn't rape her immediately. He was afraid. When he returned two hours later, he touched the cold body and realized that he had to. Above all else, Novoselov appears to enjoy philosophizing on various topics or indulging in world conclusion, as he referred to his highly intellectual thought process. He could engage in hours-long debates about what constitutes evil and who is to blame. He could dissect Gorbachev and Perestroika, the latest amnesty, and the moral and ethical character of pre-trial detention center personnel. This philosopher adhered to a standard murder scheme, a blow with a heavy object to the head or back of the head, followed by a clamp around the neck and strangulation. He only deviated from this method once when he killed two young children, a boy and a girl. He stabbed them with a sharply honed electrode, which he had concealed beneath his bicycle's saddle. He disposed of their bodies in a ditch, remembering to retrieve the gum he had bought for the boys from their pockets. I intended to give it to someone else, he explained. The ages of his victims ranged from six years old to nearly fifty. He was particularly fond of young boys, killing and raping them. 
If something about an adult woman displeased him while staying overnight in a cottage, he would deal with her too. After the murder, he wasn't hesitant to rummage through their pockets, taking even small items like handkerchiefs and powders. He had been incarcerated and released multiple times. He received a maximum sentence of 15 years, but due to an amnesty or good behavior, he was released early. While in prison colonies and later in freedom, he painted commissioned pieces, landscapes, swans on ponds, and groups of children playing by streams. He was a skilled artist who poured his soul into his work. He always tried to treat people compassionately, which often earned him the privilege of staying overnight, making acquaintances, receiving meals, and even obtaining clothing for his journey. In a psychiatric hospital in a district of Dushanbe, where he spent around six months, he was spoken of with a unique, reverential warmth. He was perceived as a profoundly decent and intelligent man, with a rich inner world. Calculating him proved difficult, hindering the establishment of a pattern in his murders. His presence in his hometown of Sarapul, Udmurtia, had long been forgotten, and little was remembered about him in other places he had temporarily resided. His mother had long considered him missing. Years had passed without a word from him. Gone. Vanished. Dissolved. Before his second stint in prison, Novoselov once asked his wife to call the police. She was alarmed. Why? I have a lot to tell them, he grinned. In the end, the police arrived and took him away, and shortly afterward, he received a sentence. However, it wasn't for his murders but rather for escaping from a settlement colony. Back then, I didn't have the courage to confess, Novoselov admitted. I couldn't. In the colony where I was imprisoned, I wanted to write a confession a couple of times, but who knows? Perhaps my will was weak. So, I remained silent. This time, the philosopher wasn't lying. It was pointless now. It's clear, Novoselov stated. Under Tajik laws or Russian ones, that's it, I've had enough. Sitting in his detention center cell, Novoselov requested permission to draw something bright and cheerful on the wall. Swans on a pond, a group of boys. His request was denied. 